are a little bit west of Two Harbors on the North Shore at a property that is being treated for spruce budworm damage. This property is owned by Jordan Blessing. He lives out here with his family. He's got a couple kids and they've got, they're kind of homesteading out here. And it's, they've got a lovely view out over the shore. And very quickly realized that they had a problem. They've got a lot of dead and dying balsam fir and spruce. Really big fire hazard, doesn't look great. Makes it hard to go out here and enjoy the property and do any recreation. It's not great for the other trees. This is a really gorgeous site with a lot of maple and it's actually really unique with how much oak is out here and it was all swallowed up by the dead balsam fir. So anything to get those out and improve the forest health. They actually saw their neighbor had a similar project, saw the logger out there working, went over and talked to them. That happened to also be one of our projects. So the logger connected them to me and I came out here, walked the property with the landowner, put together a plan, kind of mapped out the different sections of the property and what our goals were going to be, put their application together and they were lucky enough to get funded. We're doing this project because the spruce budworm has killed most of the balsam on the property as well as the spruce and by removing the spruce budworm infected trees it'll release the understory allow it to grow and also be a healthier forest as a whole. Spruce budworm attacks balsam trees primarily and then gets into the spruce trees by eating all of the new growth that comes out on the tree, thus killing the tree over a period of time. These trees have been infected probably four to five years now, so they have been slowly declining, and right toward the end of their decline is when you really start to notice how bad it is and start realizing that all of the trees have gotten completely eaten and are dying off. This project is a little over 19 acres. On this site, we've got a lot of balsam. That's the big one that we're taking out. But in addition to that, it's kind of a unique site in the sense that there is oak growing in here, which oak does not normally grow a lot on the North Shore. There's aspen growing, there's ash, there's maple, and there's birch. So there's quite a diverse stand of healthy hardwoods through here. And by taking out the balsam, we're actually releasing those trees to grow better. Number one goal for almost all of these projects is the fire hazard. It's pretty obvious you, you walk out there and see these gray trees with lots of fine fuels. If they were to go up, not only do we not want fire out here, period, but that's a pretty hot fire that's gonna get up into the crown and damage other trees. This is a gorgeous area. They bought this because they want to enjoy it, let their kids play out here, enjoy the winter out here, and you can't do that when there's a lot of dead trees that are going to fall and are blocking your way. They also just want to be good stewards of the forest. They've got a unique site here with a lot of oak and maple, which is kind of rare, and they want to be good stewards about that and preserve those trees and help them grow and have a resource for the next generation. It turns into quite a fire risk hazard, quite a hazard in general for anybody recreating outside. A bunch of tall dead trees hanging out could always fall on you or create other issues on the property. I think this landowner specifically wanted to do some skiing or recreating on the property. It's a lot easier when you don't have a bunch of dead trees. When you have a standing dead tree, that's a significant fire hazard. We've all seen the videos at Christmas time about making sure that you don't accidentally let your Christmas tree on fire. Those Christmas trees go up really fast. In essence, these are acres and acres of dead Christmas trees. They can light very easily and burn very intensely. If a fire were to get started in these dead trees, it would be a big deal up in this area right now. Luckily, we have not had any fires in this immediate area. Although the fire risk throughout this area is very high, if we get a few miles northeast of here is where the Greenwood fire took place. And a large part of that fire was all of the poorly managed forest areas, including all of the dead balsam. In a lot of these places where we've mulched around people's houses, these are places that are going to create small fire breaks, even if it is just around somebody's house. So the fire hazard alone is just one aspect of it. The other issue that comes into play is with all of these standing dead trees, you end up shading out the ground. 
So you end up with different levels of canopy and nothing new can start growing. The trees that have grown past the dead balsam are able to continue to grow, but no new trees are gonna keep growing in those areas because those balsam are shading that area out. The, the dead trees are shading out any new growth. So you end up with a stagnant forest or a forest that is one level only, that you only have an upper canopy rather than multiple levels of canopy in the forest. There are two methods actually happening. The forest stand improvement, which is cutting down of dead and dying vegetation. And then there's the woody residue treatment, which is cleaning up that fuel load after it hits the ground. Mulching is done often. Another way is through burning, piling the vegetation, and then burning it usually done during a wetter season to reduce fire risk? I've done a lot of similar projects using different processes. The mulcher is probably the most efficient. It's smaller equipment, which lets them get in on trickier sites, and they don't need to build the access you'd need for traditional logging equipment. And it's definitely more labor efficient compared to doing it by hand. I've had some people do these projects by hand with a chainsaw. Those are probably the prettiest at the end, but man is that a lot of work and it's just absolutely not feasible for a lot of people, especially when you're talking tens of acres. It does leave a lot of debris on some of these sites. This site, the trees were mostly smaller. Most of the balsam was under eight inches. So that makes it a really good site for mulching. If they're bigger than that, I usually try and steer away from recommending mulching because you're gonna end up with just too much debris on the ground. In that case, I wanna get somebody either in with a traditional logging setup to take the debris off site or pile it and burn it or do something to remove some of it because you're just gonna end up with too much stuff. But in this case, it was mostly smaller trees, stuff that's gonna break down pretty quickly and not add up to you know, feet and feet of mulch if they leave it all on site. This method is fairly new in this area. I started with a ASV style mulcher about six years ago, and we started dabbling into some of these programs as NRCS was really getting rolling up here. We've since expanded. The technology has changed a little bit to increase the performance and productivity of this equipment. So it's been a cycle that's really taken off up here over the past six years. This method is very effective at reducing fire risk. Green growing trees are very hard to light on fire. It takes a lot of heat to get a green tree to burn. The growing trees are absorbing water and they're absorbing nutrients. They're really working well to lower the risk of any fire. The mulch in contact with the ground is gonna be absorbing water. And anyone who's tried to get that bottom row of firewood to light after it's been sitting on the ground all summer knows the challenges that go into getting wet wood to burn. The machines can take both standing trees and down trees and turn them into mulch. On bigger trees, the machine will actually lift the head up and cut the tree off up by the branches and then run down the stem to turn it into mulch while it's still standing. The stuff that hits the ground, the head gets run over that as well, and that gets chewed up also. So we're able to take anything from small brush to 12 inch or larger diameter trees and turn them into mulch, both by working from the top down and cleaning up what's already on the ground. The equipment that we're currently running on this project is a CAT 321 excavator with a Seamoth mulching head on it, and then an ASV style carrier that's made by Vermeer that runs a similar mulching head. And the two of them are working together. We needed to have both pieces of equipment on this particular job because of the terrain. There's some challenges with the hill and how steep it is in places. There's actually cliffs in the back. The excavator is able to reach up and around on some of the cliffs and the steep areas where the ASV isn't able to get in there. The ASV will cover flat ground faster than the excavator, but can't do challenging terrain. And so we brought the excavator in here as well. This is a kind of a unique job in the sense that we actually have both machines running at the same time on this job. So the machines, they're not the type of machine where you would just go to the local dealership and pick one up. These machines are specifically built for doing mulching work. There's 
a lot of variations and tweaks that we've made to these machines over the years in order to make them what they are. In essence, both of them run under the same principle. And that principle is that there's a drum style attachment on the front of the machine that's spinning anywhere from 2000 to 3000 RPM. And that either has a carbide style hammer or a sharp knife on that drum. One of the machines takes about 45 cutters and the other one takes 17 cutters. The machine moves the head around to move the cutters into the standing wood and in turn turns that standing wood into small pieces of mulch or wood chip, if you will, depending on how often we go over it or how many passes we make on it. Each time we touch that wood, it chews it up into smaller pieces. On this particular job, because of the heavy rock component, we're having a slightly rougher finish than normal on it, just because carbides and steel, when it hits rock, turns into little pieces of chunked up metal and these cutters are expensive that go on the head. So a lot of the material on the ground, we try and get as much slurped up off of the ground and chewed into small pieces as we can, but without diving down into the rock or getting down under the top soil. There's a couple of benefits to having a little bit coarser of debris on these jobs. The coarser debris will help regeneration come back faster. Smaller pieces tend to lock up the nitrogen and change topsoil. The bigger pieces allow for new growth to grow around the material and up through it. We've been having phenomenal success doing this type of work on these jobs and having just the right amount of regeneration come back where landowners are able to have areas that they can plant trees, some areas that they can plant grasses, some areas that they can leave untouched and just let natural regeneration take place. Weather dependent, these projects take approximately a week to two weeks, depending what equipment we have in here. It's looking really, really good. The operator on this site is really good at running the equipment that he's got. He does a really nice job of working around existing trees. I was a little bit nervous. There's a lot of terrain on this one, which makes it difficult. There's a lot of rock, there's a lot of steep slopes, and there's a lot of existing trees that we wanted to keep, maple and oak, and we want to be careful around those. And he's done a wonderful job. The mulch is also really nice for that. The level of debris it puts down gives a little bit of surface protection so that you're not compacting the roots of those trees. And it lets us work in the summer. A lot of these jobs have to be done in the winter on frozen ground or in hot, hot summer when it's really dry. We're standing out here in June and it's been raining for days and days before this, but the mulcher is a smaller equipment. It's got tracks, it's putting down its own slash mat as it goes. And that allows us to work in a lot more conditions than you would with other setups. I think this method is great. Uh, versus other methods. The, the mulching works really quickly. It allows the landowner to get the job wrapped up fairly quick and it reduces the risk of starting a fire by doing piling burning. There's always a risk there of the fire spreading. So this method is preferred by most landowners just due to quickness and it looks great afterwards. The landowner here is Jordan Blessing. Last year we were working on an NRCS project for the neighbors down the hill and Jordan approached my operator while he was working on their job, liked the work that we were doing, had us come up and look at his project, and we had him contact NRCS in order to get the process started on having the cost share, the funding taken care of, and he was able to get into this cycle so that we were able to come back and continue working through this stand of forest. So we've actually got a couple year gap here between each project, get one done and then move into the next. And next year, potentially we'll be moving farther up the hill to the next landowner as well. Each person's gonna be a little bit different on what they wanna do with their property after we're done. Some people leave it the way that it is. It's gonna be heavily dependent on what was left over. One area could be heavy to balsam and light on species that you would wanna have around. Other areas could be heavy to oak or maple or birch with just a very small balsam component. Some of those areas, just letting them continue to grow is a good thing. Other areas, some people are planting other native trees. Some people like to create wildlife habitat by planting species that local fauna enjoys eating. 
So depending on the landowner's goals will really help determine what they continue to do with their property. So my property sits up on a hill. Um, it's kind of in a quiet part of uh, this region. It's 20 acres and it's a mix of uh, a lot of pine, a spruce, balsam, but it's also got some neat hardwoods with oak, maple, elm, and some birch. If you were to look at a map at where our house is inland off of Lake Superior and draw a line straight to, we're probably six to eight miles inland off of Lake Superior. But on clear days, now with the forest more open and up on our ridge, we can get a good view of it. I live here with my wife, uh, my son, who is six, and we also have two dogs. We love playing outside. We've lived here for almost five years now, and over that five-year period, the trees were changing. It was always a very thickly forested kind of overgrowth with spruce and balsam, which we actually kind of liked the look of. But over the few years we've been here, we slowly watched the trees wither away, dry up, and die. And this was causing a lot of problems. They were blowing down. We were constantly having to clean up our trail system. Sometimes driving to work, there'd be one down across the road. So it was becoming a problem and it was noticeable more and more each year. That had us worried. We got to thinking more about wildfires and that too had us worried. And of course, last summer, there was the Greenwood Lake fire not that far from here. And that similarly got us thinking, oh my goodness, a log home out here with all of this dead standing spruce and balsam, we should maybe get after that. And we had some neighbors not too far away that had actually worked with the program before. They referred us to how to get in contact with people in the department. And from there, it was really quite easy once we made contact. So the plan really was set up between Beth and I. We talked about my property. We talked about the problem I was seeing with the dying trees. And she was already familiar with this in the area. And so from there, she was able to pull up all of the property maps and the satellite imaging of my property. She was able to, from that, look at the topography lines and was able to kind of section off different areas. And then she would walk through. So her and I got to walk the property on the trails and off as we were doing species count to get a sense of what healthy trees we had and to get a sense of the degree of those dying spruce and those dying balsam. And so she made up a grid, she mapped out the property, she made the plan for where the forestry project should advance. And from there, off of her drafted work, we then took that to Hall Forestry and they agreed with the plan and found it easy to access with their equipment and that's how we progressed forward. And that was fantastic. They were such an easy company to work for. They had worked with this program before, so they understood the scope of the job. And they came out, they assessed the property. We again did a walkthrough together and they had a plan in place for every inch of this acreage of how they could access it, how they could do it the most effective way and preserve the most number of good, healthy trees. And then in June of this year, they came out and did the project. And it took about 10 days total for them to make their way through the property, clearing out the dead spruce and balsam. Once Josh and Brian came from Hall Forestry, it was fun. I had a couple of days off, as well as Hudson and my wife Jenny, and we would just watch them from the window. They came in with two pieces of equipment that did the bulk of the work. One was a skid steer that had a big mulching attachment on the front, and the other was a large excavator that similarly had a large mulching head on the end of it. And with those two pieces of equipment, they would go through and they would be able to mulch right there the standing dead timber. They would also be able to mulch what was on the ground as well as they mowed over it. And it left all of the mulch there. So it scattered a thin layer of coarse mulch all across the 20 acres, relatively evenly distributed. So there weren't big piles or anything like that. And that mulch is already starting to decay down. And I imagine in a couple of years, it will be back into the soil. And it's made it really easy to get around. It's made a world of difference having cleared it out. It used to be so thick with overgrowth spruce and balsam that you couldn't even behind me throw a baseball without it going, you maybe get it to go 10 feet, but it was just so dense. Now that it's opened up, it's been an incredible property. Just sitting, watching wildlife, peering through the forest, through the open swaths, and the amount of time we get to spend now hiking, snowshoeing, once in a while cross-country skiing, and we've even set up two campsites out on the property that me and my son set up in the summer and we'll spend nights out there now that we have more space and it's so much more accessible. Especially with the forest being a bit more open, we've identified some topography that actually has made some excellent sledding hills for my six-year-old, but also for me too. We've had a lot of snow this winter and it just seems to keep coming, but it makes this place look even more beautiful. I think the snow depth here must be close to, I bet you we're pushing 40 inches now. We just got another eight or 10 inches earlier this week to add to it.
<laughs> so I was trying to get ready for this day where we'd be out in the woods more and I've been a little busy at work. I haven't had much time to keep up with the trails and so the snow depth kind of got away from me. I thought, boy, if I could get lucky, I would take this vintage Yamaha snowmobile out on the trails and pack it down to make it a little easier. But I only made it about 100 yards. It was about one minute of snowmobile time and 45 minutes of trying to dig it out. On the days where Hudson's not at school and I'm not at work, we try to get out in the woods one way or the other. Today we're planning on going for a walk. We're gonna try to make it out to where there's some big oak trees we like to go by and then circle back to the house after that. I think our whole family, my wife and son included, are very happy with moving forward, having this done, because it made our property accessible. The hiking has been incredible. The views, as we get up high, we can see the lake like never before. Although we're quite inland, when we get up on the higher ridges, we have great views of the lake now. And we have sledding, we have opportunities to go on snowmobile rides when it's not quite so deep. It's really made this whole 20 acres a big playground for my six-year-old. So when we moved here and we saw the property, we knew we liked the space, we liked the acreage, we liked having it pretty densely wooded. We liked to go for hikes, so we were planning on making hiking trails. Some were there already, but we needed to make those more pronounced. So getting out, walking our dogs, going hiking, trail running was all part of what we wanted to do. And we like keeping an eye on the animals too. So we have some trail cameras set up and we see what kind of wildlife passes through this area. One of the biggest things that we've seen in terms of improvement after getting the logging done was the wildlife. I do think things slowed down a little bit. I think the heavy equipment going through for that week scared a few critters away, but it didn't take long to see that the benefit really paid off. We've seen more wildlife now this late summer, fall, and now early winter than we ever had before. Prior to this, it was so thick, it was almost impossible to walk through. For myself, I imagine the wildlife had a similar problem. And now that it's more clear and more open, we've seen more white-tailed deer than ever before. Some of the biggest bucks I've seen in the area have been crossing through on my trail cams. For a while, we had pine marten and fisher. Those were scared away for a while, but now this fall, we've been seeing more pine marten and fisher. And even this fall, right before hibernation, we had a black bear family, a mama and two cubs that were circling through the area. And I just think it's easier to get around. And I think it's opening up more food sources too, as, as the sunlight's come through and some of that underbrush has started to grow up even already. Initially, after the company went through, the mulch was pretty thick, but it's a pretty coarse mulch. So there's a lot of air gaps and stuff started to grow back through in terms of regrowth quite quickly. We've seen several oak saplings already starting. We've seen a large amount of ferns and we're getting a lot of our thimbleberries back as well. It's made a huge difference. So to start the program, I didn't even know where to begin other than I had some phone numbers. So I contacted NRCS, set up a meeting with Bethany. And so we reached out to her and set up a time to meet with her in the Duluth office. And she was sort of our point person with the program and she made the rest very easy. We kind of talked about our situation, our location, and then she came out and her and I walked the property. We went through the acreage. She was looking at the degree of how much spruce and balsam we had and what the rest of the forest mix was. And she sort of separated out the acreage into different areas, highlighting where the problem was and made up a plan from there in terms of pursuing next steps with logging and forestry companies. Working with Beth was incredible. She was a tour guide for this whole project. She knew what the scope of the project was. She had a lot of past experience in how this works. And so she was phenomenal. She was easy to reach. She would answer all of my questions. And on more than one occasion, she came out to the property to be part of the planning, to be part of the species count, and to be part of watching as the job progressed. There's a lot of sugar maple on this site, which is really shade tolerant and has probably been hiding out underneath the balsam waiting for its chance to pop up in the sun for a long time. So I want to give it a chance to do that before I come in and do anything else. I'd also like to come back and check for weed issues. There's a lot of buckthorn up here unfortunately. I'm another invasive species and we try our best not to bring it in when we bring in equipment. But if we do uncover it or if it was already here and by opening it up we let it go, we can help people with weed control issues. Once these projects are wrapped up, uh, the NRCS as well as Soil and Water Conservation Districts will help write plans for reforestation, planting plans, anything with tree and shrub establishment. The landowner has specific goals. We identify those and, and help them work through them, whether that be planting more climate resilient species, planting more native habitat, or aiming planting efforts towards certain wildlife species or pollinator projects. 
quite a few people in this area have gone through this process. This would be a tough site to plant. There's a lot of rock in the ground, but we are also doing lots of planting projects, lots of deer caging. This area has really high deer populations. They all come down during the winter to yard up along the North Shore where it's a little bit warmer and they eat up all of our white pine and white cedar, which are the best. That's the classic North Shore tree is the white pine. That's what we want out here. And so we're helping a lot of people put up deer exclosures so that they can plant trees and have them actually survive. This project was funded through EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. NRCS cost share rates are set at about 50 to 75 percent of what we estimate the total cost to be. Our cost share is a flat rate, so if you can get it done for that amount, that's fantastic. If it costs you more, that's on the landowner. I'm fine with coarse woody debris. It's fantastic. It's good for wildlife. It's good for soil health. It's better for regeneration, but sometimes people want things cleaned up really nicely, especially in the immediate vicinity of their house which isn't necessarily a resource concern for us, but if they've got the contractor on site, it's a lot easier to do it now, and they're willing to put the money towards it. If you're wondering about what you can do on your forested property, you can certainly reach out to your local Natural Resource Conservation Service office. Minnesota has some excellent private consulting foresters that are also happy to help. If another landowner would like to work on a project similar to this or believes they have a forest related resource concern on their property, I would recommend reaching out to either the NRCS or a local soil and water conservation district so they can see the project as a whole, what needs to be done, why it needs to be done, and they can get from point A to B finishing the project and resolving any resource concerns they may have. You know, I couldn't recommend this enough. I think anybody living here on the North Shore where there's been the spruce budworm problem, and if they have dying spruce, dying balsam on their property, to any degree, I think it's worth reaching out to NRCS. They're very helpful with planning. They're very helpful with assessing the degree of your problem and helping identify if there's resources or financial cost sharing available. It was so easy once I made first contact to just go through those steps. It's a small amount of paperwork, really not much. And it's like a, you get a tour guide and an expert that really helps plan the project. And it makes a world of difference on your property. This is a really important landscape on the North Shore. There's a lot of unique plant communities up here, a lot of unique wildlife. A lot of people have strong ties to this landscape for recreation and their families have been around here for a long time. So protecting it is really important and taking good care of it is really important both for the people living here now and for future generations. Cleaning up around houses is really important just because of the fuel load around that house. A lot of these jobs, we treat them as if they were our own property. We don't want to do something on someone else's property that we wouldn't do on our own. My own house, we had a lot of dead balsam. I live a few miles away from here and we went through and took out all of that balsam and cleaned up the forest and now I've got healthy young woods. When we've got windstorms that come through, I'm not the one cleaning up blow down across my driveway. If we have a fire that comes through our neighborhood, I know that my property is going to be a portion that would be a fire break, similar to this property right here, which in turn would save their house, save kids, save families, livelihoods very important to keep those dead fuels away from the places that we live. You have things like the Greenwood fire that occurred last year devastating a lot of acres that might not be completely mitigated through projects like these but the risk on a home would be significantly reduced through this project. I think this project was one of the best ideas I've had. I'm so glad my neighbors informed me about it and then making contact with Beth at NRCS and planning it. It was so helpful. I was really worried about wildfire, and not only that, but the headache of constantly having trees falling down and a tangled mess to clean up every weekend in even the lightest windstorms. So I 100% would recommend this. It would really be a cost prohibitive thing to do on your own if you were to say, as a private landowner, I'm going to clear 20 acres by myself or with a logging company. But with the NRCS program and the cost sharing that comes with that, it was a no brainer for us. I'm very happy with doing it.